Thank you. May God be praised. Okay, this evening we again have Brother Phil Yoder with us from Costa Rica, and we are looking forward to this final evening of hearing what God has for us through his word and through his servant tonight. So Phil, if you would come, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll give him time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here like this this evening. We thank you that through Christ we can be here. We thank you, Lord, that we have the word of God in our hands. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless our brother with wisdom and understanding to open the truths of of your word to us tonight. Mm -hmm. Father, open our hearts as a congregation to receive the word with gladness and to respond to it as we ought. Father, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We've come to the last evening of this series of meetings, and I do want you to know that Elaine and I have immensely enjoyed our stay here with you. I would just like to take this opportunity to thank you for all that you've done, especially I think it would be in order to name Brother John Lee for bending over backwards to make sure that we have everything we need. Thank you. Brother David Yoder and his wife Sarah allowed us to stay in their little cabin, which we enjoyed tremendously. There was a quiet place with privacy in which we could study, and the environment was... Beautiful. Thank you, David and Sarah. I want to thank each one of you that invited us into your homes for a meal. We had good food and wonderful hospitality. Again, it was, has been a privilege to be with you. And I would invite each one of you, if it works out someday, to come visit us in Costa Rica. Don't all come at once. The theme of the meetings has been return to the Lord your God. I don't know what the effect of the messages have had in your life, but... I'm sure that all of us, as we analyze our own lives, see areas where God is calling us to return to Him. There's something about our human nature that tends to stray. And we need periodically to be reminded to return. To God, to truth. Because it's imperative that we build our lives on the truth of God's Word. That we know God. Because all of our life, the way we live our lives, depend on what we think about God, what we know about Him. And hopefully, Each one of us can say that we do know Him. Tonight, I'd like for you to open your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to be reading the first seven verses. reads like this, Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. 
that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned and testified. For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. Tonight I've entitled the message, Return to a Life of Holiness. I'd like to look at a few more scriptures before we go on. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or conduct, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves, from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as He hath chosen us in Him, that we should be holy and without blame before Him. Colossians chapter 1, and verse 22. To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. Is there any question that God has called us to holiness? Today I hear people say repeatedly, well, nobody's perfect. We all sin. But God understands. He's merciful and He forgives. While these words may be true, the attitude that they express will keep us from becoming what God wants us to be. I believe that even within our churches, too often we've lowered the standard that we require of ourselves and others. And we've lost our vision and our passion for a life of holiness. We need to define holiness. The word holy is a Greek term which has both a negative and a positive connotation. The word simply means separated. But I think the definition would be to be separated from something and uh, at the same time consecrated to Something else. The idea is to be separated from that which is displeasing to God and to be consecrated exclusively to Him and to His service. We have some examples of this in the Old Testament. If we go to Numbers chapter 8, I'd like for you to follow this and so we can understand what God means when He asks us to be holy. Numbers chapter 8, and I'm going to read verse 11. Here God is speaking about uh, His choosing the Levites to be His servants in the temple. He says in verse 11, And Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord, for an offering of the children of Israel. 
and they, that they may execute the service of the Lord. Verse 14. Thus shalt thou separate the Levites from among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. Verse 16. For they are wholly given unto me from among the children of Israel, instead of such as open every womb, and even instead of the firstborn of all the children of Israel have I taken them unto me. Now, God had said earlier that every firstborn was to belong to him. And here he makes a slight change, and he says that the Levites will take that place. And he says that the Levites will be separated from their brethren, and they will be offered to the Lord as an exclusive group of people to serve Him in His temple. They were to be made holy. We notice um, in Exodus 39, verses 30 and 31, that the Lord commanded that a golden plate be put upon the... Uh, Mitre of Aaron, which said, Holiness to the Lord. In other words, wherever Aaron went, there was that bold statement right on his forehead that said that he had been separated from all people to be given to God and to his service. Another example would be the utensils that were made for the use of the tabernacle. These utensils were presented before the Lord, and Moses was to sprinkle them with blood from the sacrifice in an act of consecration of these utensils for the work of the Lord. They were not to be used for any other use at all except for the work of God in the tabernacle. So they were holy utensils. The Levites were a holy tribe. They had been separated from all else and consecrated to God for His exclusive use. And now tonight God has called you and me to be holy. That would mean that God has called us to be separated from the contaminations of this world and to a life that corresponds with the calling that we've been given. Paul said that we should walk worthy of the vocation to which we were called. God has called us to consecrate our whole being, body, soul, and spirit to God. And that we be found blameless when Christ returns. In other words, that we do not use our bodies, our spirits, our souls for things of this world, for things that are not worthy of the holy character of God. We are to be holy because He is holy. We are to be like Him. Now, I think we do need to understand that holiness is, first of all, a work of God. When a person repents of his sin, of his rebellion against God, and by faith accepts the work of Jesus on the cross for his personal needs, God accepts that person as his child. He separates him from the world. and chooses him and accepts him as his own personal possession. A peculiar people. A people acquired for his own use. And he puts the seal of the Holy Spirit into our hearts to identify us as the people of God. Just as Aaron wore the, the plaque on his forehead, holiness to the Lord. The Holy Spirit has been placed in our lives as a seal, 
as an identification to, uh, as to who we belong to and to what our purpose is. We're called to be saints. Now, one thing we need to notice that in English, we have two words, holy and the word saint or sanctify, which actually, if I understand correctly, uh, are speaking of basically the same thing. Um, as a matter of fact, in Spanish, it's, a, it's the same word, to sanctify or to be a saint or to be holy. Um, and it's interesting to notice that uh, in the New Testament, God's people are called a holy people. In Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, Colossians, Paul often begins his epistles by saying, Paul, to the saints that are in their respective places. In Costa Rica, where most of the population is Catholic, we hear a lot about the saints. But the saints are people that have died many years ago. And as time goes on, um, their example um, and uh, the miracles they perform, perhaps, indicate that they have reached a level of Holiness that makes them saints. And the Catholic Church often has a ceremony in which they um, grant sainthood to individuals that have been dead probably a hundred years or more. But what I would like for us to notice tonight is that God has called us to that position of sainthood tonight, today. In our lives, God has called us to be saints. And God has done that work. God has, made, has put us into that position of sainthood because He has separated us unto Himself. He has chosen us. But it is also true that we remember that sainthood, or to be holy, is also a progressive experience. Our becoming saints positionally does not automatically make us holy or blameless practically. Let me explain that. Because I do believe that when, we, when God puts us into that position, when we become holy, we are blameless, yes, in the sense that God has forgiven our sins and uh, we have entered into a relationship with Him where He has cleansed our conscience and holds nothing against us any longer. Nevertheless, that does not automatically change the responses and the way we confront the circumstances of life overnight. We've programmed into our lives so long certain responses, certain ways to live, that we must now cooperate with God in obedience to Him as together we work in ourselves to bring about holiness of character. The goal of the Christian is to align his conduct with his position. And I believe that is what God is concerned about and is working in our lives to achieve. So as we obey God's law, his word, we become more like him. I think we've spoken of that in, uh, on other occasions. So holiness of life becomes a personal responsibility. Although it is the work of God, it also is our own responsibility. I think the brethren mentioned that in the devotional tonight or in the opening comments, that we do become responsible. 
as we hear the Word of God and what God asks of us, we do become responsible. Paul says that the Thessalonians had learned of him a new walk of life, a new conduct, and how to please God. But he says that they should abound in this more and more. It's a growing experience. It's a growing process. The Holy Spirit of God active in our lives to bring about the character of God. To help us to become what we are positionally. It becomes very practical and it involves things that we should do and things that we should not do. Now, if we go back to Thessalonians um, chapter 4, we notice that it says, This is the will of God, even your sanctification. This is the will of God, that you be made holy. In our modern world, life centers around ourselves and our needs and our desires. Our goal is to be happy. To have a comfortable and a prosperous a life as possible. The Bible tells us that as we live in the world we are that is corrupted by sin, we're constantly exposed to sin, to the problems, to sickness, to death. The condition of this world has destroyed the possibility of true, lasting happiness here as the current of this world tries to drag us away from God. But God is not so concerned for our happiness as He is for our holiness. Chapter 4 and verse 3, the will of God is our sanctification. It doesn't say the will of God is that you be happy. So God's primary concern is that we prepare for the future. As it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, that our whole body, soul, and spirit be made holy as we wait for the Lord's return. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So happiness in this life is a blessing. It's not a right. Because we live in a fallen world. Now that doesn't mean that the Christian life is not joyful. And I think we need to make that distinction. One of the fruits of the Spirit in the life of the Christian is joy. But joy is not quite the same as happiness. Happiness would be more the emotion we feel when everything goes well, goes according to our wishes, our desires. Joy is something we can experience even in the midst of adversity. So the Christian life is joyful, but it's not necessarily our right to live in happiness at all times. That doesn't mean that we don't experience happiness as well. So God calls us to sanctification. That every one of you should know how or that we learn how to possess our vessel in sanctification and honor. That we should learn how to gain dominion over or to conquer our vessel. And I think here he is referring probably basically to our body the vessel that He has given us in which we live. And it, we've been called to gain dominion over it and to use it in sanctification, holily and in honor to God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 19. For as ye yielded your members, your bodily members, as servants to uncleanness, 
and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even so now yield you your, your members as servants to righteousness unto holiness. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21. It says, If any man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use. There needs to be a purging, a cleansing, a washing from sin so that we can be a vessel unto honor, a vessel that God would be pleased to use in His service. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. I'll just turn to that. I can't quote it exactly. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye have, are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, Paul says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And here where Paul says, I keep under my body, the idea is that of a soldier that comes back from the battle victorious. And he brings with him the conquered enemy. And it's a picture when he says, I put under my body. It's the picture of the conqueror who puts his enemy to his knees and he places his foot on his neck and he raises his sword in victory. Paul says, that's where I place my body. So that God can be glorified through me without being contaminated with the things of this world. So sanctification is the process by which we learn by the power of God to exercise dominion over and to crucify the carnal impulses so we can direct our energies into pleasing God with our conduct. <clears throat> our body with all its faculties needs to become a servant of righteousness and not a tyrant that enslaves us. I'm concerned about an emphasis that I see among us so often today. And that's the emphasis on being real. You heard that? We need to be real. Depends what you mean by that. But this emphasis is being translated today into giving freedom to our emotions and feelings of the moment. Thereby we justify our outbursts of anger, of giving in to sensuality, to criticism, to smoldering resentment. It's allowing the flesh to control the impulses of the moment. That's being real, we're told. But let me tell you that I think if we swallow this idea, it takes away, it takes us away from God and from usefulness in His kingdom. That's not what it means to be holy. Being real in this world often means it's the idea to simply giving a license to fleshly living, to sensuality, and to sinfulness. Being real in the real sense, in the biblical sense, does mean that we recognize these feelings that rise within us. Let's be honest. You know that you feel some of these emotions 
at times. But instead of giving vent to them, holiness means that we bow our hearts at that moment and we choose to obey God. Holiness becomes a choice. It's not just an emotion. If you wait until you have an emotion that will produce holiness in you, you'll probably wait a long time. But holiness becomes a choice, the result of a choice. It's choosing to obey the Holy Spirit's promptings to be like Jesus. When you feel those angry feelings rising within you, what do you do? I'd like to challenge you. If need be, go to your room. Go out under a tree. I don't care where you are. But go somewhere and bow your heart to God. And recognize, be real. Recognize, God, I'm struggling with carnal impulses that are wrong, that are unholy. And Father, I want to give my life to You. I choose to respond in the Spirit of Jesus. And let me tell you that when you do that, the power of God is unleashed to meet with your spirit and give you the power for victory, to overcome. It may not happen all at once. You may need to do it again and again. But the time will come when you will look back and you will say, although I am not what I should be, I am not even what I could be, but I thank God I'm not what I was. There's growth as we become more and more like Jesus in His holiness. So we need to remember that we choose not to allow our body to be governed, it says in in 1 Thessalonians, by the lust of concupiscence, which simply would mean a very strong, illicit desire. To live by our carnal impulses brings us under the wrath of God. So let's be careful with this idea of being real. The wrath of man, the Bible says, does not work the righteousness of God. Carnal impulses do not work the righteousness of God. You can say, but but it's holy wrath. When our emotions rise in indignation, it's almost guaranteed that it will be mixed with a bit of carnality. Jesus didn't trust it. God doesn't trust it. He said the wrath of God doesn't work the righteousness of God. The wrath of man doesn't work the righteousness of God. And I think that's a principle that is applicable to Almost any fleshly impulse. Verse 6, 1 Thessalonians 4, says the Lord is the avenger of all such. The Lord is the avenger of those who live by their carnal impulses. In 1 Thessalonians here, it, um, Paul uses an example Maybe we can't say it's an example because he was directly addressing um, illicit sexual desires. But I think what we see here are principles that can be applied to almost any area of um, our carnality. But I am going to look at what Paul says and the example he uses in the context here. Areas where Paul says that we need to experience the sanctification of the Spirit as the Word of God cleanses us. 
in this case, illicit sexual desire. The pagan environment in which Paul lived and, or the Thessalonian church existed was given to sexual impurity, to sexual immorality. Fornication was so common that it was hardly considered wrong. As a matter of fact, it was practiced in their pagan worship ceremonies. And the church had been born into this, or within this, ungodly, immoral culture. I think it's very pertinent to us today, because our society is, I don't know, I wasn't, I don't, uh, I wasn't in Thessalonica back in those times, but I dare say that our society is probably just as immoral as they were back then. Brother Aaron Lapp said this morning that he becomes concerned. I don't remember the word he used, but I think it was a little stronger than that perhaps. At the, at the direction our society in the United States is moving. And I don't think any of us would argue with the fact that we live in a pornographic society. Our society is given to this area of carnality. And we're being bombarded on a daily basis with the temptation to sexual impurity. The problem is that we're getting used to it. <clears throat> in our thoughts, in our actions, we're deciding how far we allow ourselves to go as we face this type of temptation. But as we do that, our resistance begins to lower. Let's not talk about society as a whole. Let's talk about the church. As I look around myself in the Christian world today, I see that modesty is being compromised. Recently, we had a visitor in Costa Rica from a foreign mission, not in Costa Rica. And he was telling me that a group of young people from the church that sponsors their mission here in the United States, a conservative Mennonite church, a group of young people from their church came to the mission to do a work project, I think. And he said in the afternoons after work was done, they would get together to play volleyball. And he said he was floored when he saw the girls playing volleyball in shorts. I'm not going to tell you which constituency it was a part of, but it was what we know as a very conservative Mennonite group. He said they did wear a little flap in the front and a little flap in the back. He said, he asked me the question, he said, what shall I do? We're teaching our people the principles of modesty. And the very churches that support our mission are losing what we're trying to get across. That's not your church, is it? But what's the direction we're moving? The physical interaction among our young people today or among our people, physical interaction between the sexes is being accepted. It used to be known 
that men and women need to keep a respectable distance. But today, it no longer means anything for boys and girls to hug each other in a very informal setting. And it's being accepted. I mentioned it this morning, the hands-off policy. Today, we're being told that's for the old fogies. Let me just tell you, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm going to stick out my neck and I'm going to tell you that if a young man tells you, and young ladies, listen to what I'm saying, if a young man tells you that the sight and the touch of the female body does not affect him as a man, I believe it's one of three things. Either he's lying, he's abnormal, or his senses have been numbed by overexposure. Am I right? But today the young men are saying, no, no, that's nothing. That doesn't bother me. We're concerned about some of these things. Where are we going? Are we still a holy nation? Are we still a holy people? Sexual sin is a sin against God, first of all. We can go to the example of Joseph. Someone mentioned that in the course of these meetings. Where Joseph was tempted by an ungodly woman. You may say that Joseph was a saint so that it probably didn't bother him that much. But I don't read that into Scripture because Joseph, it says that Joseph wouldn't even be in the house with her anymore. Why? Because he was made of flesh and blood. Joseph didn't trust himself to be with her because he was aware, he acknowledged the fact that he was affected. Therefore, he had to take some drastic measures. But the reason Joseph did that is because he said, how could I commit such a great sin against my God? Sexual sin violates the beauty and the sacredness of the marriage relationship. It lowers the beauty of God's design to cruel exploitation of another person. Fornication is a sin against your neighbor. It says here in Thessalonians, verse 6, uh, verse six Paul says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother. It says in any matter, but he's speaking specifically of the sexual area because it violates the dignity of their personhood. It destroys the dignity, the worth of someone's daughter, someone's wife, someone's sister or brother or father, as it may be. How would you feel if some fellow came around and took advantage of your daughter or of your sister? But we no longer see it so serious when it's me. Sexual sin uses a person as an object without any real love or without any sense of responsibility. 
That's why God created marriage. Where love can be expressed within the confines of commitment and responsibility. Sexual sin is a sin against yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says this. It's a sin against yourself. How so? Recently, I was speaking to a man who came to visit me about his spiritual condition. He had at one time been a part of our church. He left the church, went out into the world, left his wife, lived a life of ungodliness. He said to me, he said, you'll never know how much harder it is to face temptation once you have allowed yourself, allowed your appetites to be awakened. So if you give yourself to the license to sexual impurity, you are simply increasing the power of temptation in your life and the guarantee of victory is growing less and less. In Hosea chapter 4, the English says, fornication takes away the heart. The Spanish translation says, it destroys sound judgment. I don't know how you have observed, but to me it's interesting how that when a man is overtaken by living by his carnal impulses, how his total life falls apart. I've seen it happen over and over again. All at once the marriage falls apart. The home falls apart. The children are leave, go their own way. Business falls apart because a man has given himself to carnal impulses, to live by the impulse of the moment, and it destroys sound judgment. When we're overtaken by living by carnal impulses, our life also will suffer the consequences. The command to be holy is not a restriction that should be hard to bear. But it is a restriction for our own protection and for our own joy and well-being. the area of sexual temptation has come much closer home within the last number of years through the advances of modern technology. I don't know how you deal with the issue of cell phones. I believe that cell phones can be used rightly. We all know that. That's our number one argument. But they can also be used wrongly. And it takes the Spirit of God in our hearts. It takes a commitment to God to maintain our sexual purity and holiness as we handle these gadgets of modern technology. The thing of texting is becoming an issue that we cannot ignore. And I could go on and I could talk for a long time on some of these issues. But just on the issue of sexual purity. When a man and a woman begin to text each other. It's just a casual friendship. But if it continues, the time comes when you're tempted to cross a line in texting her or him things that you would never say face to face. 
because your phone, the text, you're not seeing each other. It's, it, there, it, there's, there's the illusion of not being totally connected. So you allow yourself to cross a line that you would never cross face to face. And then depending on the response from the other side, you've begun something that doesn't stop. Apart from that, I believe that if we're not careful, we destroy our own capacity to communicate and to experience personal relationships. That's another topic. And this is a problem that doesn't exist just among young people. What about Internet? Pornography. It's right at your fingertips anymore. It can begin by accident. Something pops up that you weren't necessarily looking for. But it stimulates your curiosity. And the next time, it's a thing that happens because of curiosity. But it comes to the point where you're hooked. And you deliberately look for it. Pornography can be a habit, an addiction, that is just as hard to overcome as drugs. And I know a little bit about that because we've worked with drug addicts. Would I be so far off if I would dare say that I imagine that there are people sitting here tonight who have struggled with some of these things? Are you holy? Our courtship standards begin to lower. I have four daughters. And they were a bit older. Two of them are married today. They were a bit older when they began a dating relationship. One day a brother and I were talking about this. And he asked me a question. He said, Phil, don't you think that maybe if they would lower their standards of expectation a bit, it would be easier? I told my daughters, never lower your standards. Never. We need to return to the Lord our God and escape before these things destroy us. Because they will destroy us. Satan knows that. That's why it becomes so difficult. And another thing I think we need to recognize is that when we keep these things hidden, the temptation gathers strength. One of the things that makes temptation strong is the fact that we keep it hidden. Bring it out into the open. Confess it. And the temptation loses some of its power. I'm sure there are many other areas where God is calling us to sanctification. We spoke of some of them earlier. There's an anger problem. Anger is something that destroys relationships. God wants to sanctify our hearts. Let me just say that any area of your life that has not been separated from the world and from your carnal impulses, the emotions of the moment, and consecrated to Jesus Christ 
that area in your life is unholy. When Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, the Bible says that he entered into the temple and he took the golden and the silver utensils that had been consecrated to God. And he took them to Babylon and put them in the treasury. There they remained until Belshazzar became the king. The Bible tells us the story of when Belshazzar in one of his pagan feasts was drinking wine with his governors, his officials, and his wives, their wives. And after he had drunk wine, it says in Daniel chapter 5, he sent to the treasury of Babylon and he said, bring the utensils of the temple in Jerusalem, bring them in here to our feast, and we want to drink wine out of those utensils. So they brought them into the feast. And in their debauchery, began to drink wine out of the consecrated utensils of God. And it was at that time that the finger appeared on the wall and said, Belshazzar, you have been weighed in the balances and you are found wanting. This night, you're going to lose your life. I don't know what would have happened if Belshazzar wouldn't have done that. But to take that which has been consecrated to God in holiness and to use it for unholy purposes. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. You've been bought with a price. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. You have that plate on your forehead that says you belong exclusively to your, the Lord your God. Beware. Because Satan with his subtle tactics is gradually asking us to lower our standards. And we begin to permit more and more of the things of this world in our flesh. We've told ourselves that we know how far we can go. There's a line we won't cross. Don't kid yourself. If you allow yourself those liberties, the day will come when you cross that line. And when you cross that line, that line of your conscience, when you overstep your conscience, there's no limit to where you can go. I don't know how many of you were here this morning when Brother Ben Stolzfus had his devotions. You know, if we had time, I just wish he could come and give it again. Fathers, young men, the leaders of today within our churches, the leaders of tomorrow in our churches, the decisions you make today are going to have long-range consequences. Are we choosing holiness? Or are we choosing to be real? Are we choosing to follow God? Or do we believe that to give vent to our impulses and emotions is no such big deal? I want you to remember that God is calling us today to return to true, godly holiness. God will return for a holy people. And God has prepared for them a holy place. We cannot live by the impulses of the flesh and believe that someday God will take us into a holy heaven. 
Are you holy tonight? If God has spoken to you of areas in your life that you need the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, please don't wait. God is calling us to return to holiness. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, tonight, we recognize You as the Holy God. We believe, Father, that in Your presence, no evil can dwell. Lord, forgive us where we have believed that we can allow a bit of contamination in our lives without there being consequences. Oh God, I pray that tonight Your Holy Spirit would move among us and You would help us to see our lives as You see us. Father, in this area of sexual purity, I just pray that You would help us as men, as men of God, to rise up and be pure and be holy before You. Oh God, help us to live in such a way that we can guide the lives of our children and our young people into holiness. Lord, we love You. We want to serve You. We just pray Your blessing on us tonight. In Jesus' name, Amen.